Over the history of Assassin's Creed lore, the Assassins and Templars have been in a conflict with each other for well over 2,000 years. Both ideologies have grown significantly over the thousands of years of conflict and have seen much fluctuation in both power and influence without any sign of the war stopping. However, no matter which side was on top during the history of the conflict, the other side regrouped, re-strategized, and came back up to prominence once again. In fact, this is pretty much what every Assassin's Creed game is about on some level. However, within the modern day story of Assassin's Creed, the Templars are at a height that has not been seen in human history, while the Assassins are on the brink of extinction. So how did this happen? What changed? What events led up to the Templars' rise in the modern day, and how did they nearly eliminate the Assassins from the Earth? Well, in this video I'll be talking about all of that and more, discussing the history and formulation of Abstergo Industries, and how they brought the Templars to a height of their power that they have not seen before during the 20th and 21st centuries. This is quite a large video in terms of scope, so without further ado, let's just get right into it. Let me start off by setting the stage for how the world looked at the start of the 20th century, because it is from the political structures and powers of the early 1900s that led to the chain of events that placed the Templars and Abstergo at the height of their power. The year we're going to start is in 1908, so what was going on in the world then? Well, for some context, Theodore Roosevelt was the President of the United States, King Edward VII was the Monarch of the United Kingdom after succeeding his mother Queen Victoria following her death in 1901. And by this point, Russia had already seen a revolution from 1905 to 1906 with political unrest, worker strikes and military mutinies that led to the Russian Constitution of 1906 that pretty much was just a fancy document stating the Tsar in other words, King, was absolute leader of Russia, but there would be a half assed democratic system called the Duma that could still be totally overruled and controlled by the Tsar, who had complete control of the executive foreign policy, church, and the military. Now, what's important to note about this history I've just gone through is the Tsar of Russia at the time, Nicholas II, is in Assassin's Creed lore a holder of a piece of Eden, a staff of Eden to be exact. This was used to control the populace and definitely helped subdue the revolution of 1905. However, before June of 1908, presumed Templar covert operative Grigory Rasputin, pretty much the creepiest looking dude in human history, infiltrated the inner circle of the Russian Tsar and became very close to his family. Somewhere during that time, Rasputin stole the piece of Eden and delivered it to a Templar research facility in Tunguska that was then infiltrated by the assassins that caused an explosion known as the Tunguska event, which flattened over 2,000 square kilometers of land. The event is commonly considered in history to have been caused by a meteorite exploding in atmosphere above the region. The stage the Templars and Assassins were at during this early 20th century time is pretty much similar to what they've always been like in terms of their conflict. The Templars would continue their attempts at infiltrating politics, trying to find peace of Eden, and trying to control the world, while the Assassins would try and derail these plans and stop the Templars at all cost. However, two events occurred that gave an opening to the Templars. Two very important moments in history that was not quite intended to have the effect that it necessarily did, but help the Templars nonetheless. One of which I'll get to in a moment, and the other of which we just brushed past in fact. Rasputin taking the Staff of Eden from Russian Tsar Nicholas II. That started a chain of events that occurred that led to another revolution in Russia in 1917, and ultimately the demise of the monarchy in Russia altogether. The Duma took temporary control as a provisional government, and was eventually toppled by the Soviets, and after years of fighting and political backstabbing, the Soviet Union was formed as a communist state in 1922, a state that would have great political strength during the 20th century and importance to the world, Abstergo and the Templars. The second of these events happened in 1913, when Templar Henry Ford rolled out the assembly line. With it, a plan was formulated by the Templars in a circle that would ultimately form Abstergo Industries. The assembly line was seen by the Templars as a means to control both the workers and the capitalistic industries that employed them. Henry Ford, Ransom E. Olds, and Thomas Edison were just some of the major Templars who formulated this plan that would use not only the politics and military that they have been influencing for millennia, but the capitalistic economic system and scientific progress as well to bring the Templars to unseen heights. 
So let's fast forward to 1937. The Templars plan have been in the works for more than 25 years at this time, developing their technologies further and collecting more pieces of Eden, all the while the communist threat from the Soviet Union and around the world grew. The Templars saw communism as a threat to their capitalistic plans and sought to keep the world in conflict against them. So it was that year in 1937 that with the help of Templar puppet and US President Franklin D. Roosevelt, that Abstoker Industries was formed as a front for the Templar scientific work and means of wealth. For millennia, the Templars had been using politics as a means of reaching the pinnacle of society and achieving control. The Templars in the 20th century saw a new way. With the manipulation of the economic system of capitalism, the Templars could create an industry that fronted as a corporation, while secretly working towards the Templars' main goals. This allowed the Templars to remain out of the public eye of politics and into the homes of people all over the world through products, science, and new and advancing technologies. To spread both the influence of Abstogo and their products throughout the world, all the while culling the communist threat, the Second World War became a major piece to the Templars' plan. Granting Templar puppet Adolf Hitler an apple of Eden, the groundwork was laid for the conflict that saw Europe and many parts of the world enthralled into war. In fact, both the Soviet Union's leader Joseph Stalin and Germany's leader Adolf Hitler were puppets to the Templars during this time. This gave Abstergo the time they needed to make quiet progress and prepare for a post-war era in which it would be Abstergo that would help rebuild the world as they saw fit. Near the end of the war, in July of 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference occurred, which was a United Nations monetary and financial conference that prepared countries post-war. This saw capitalism spread throughout Europe with the aid of Abstergo and their Templar puppets throughout the different governments of the world's nations. Post-World War II, Abstergo controlled much of the world's economics and technological progress with the spread of capitalism and their political influence. This saw Abstergo's products being recognised worldwide, all the while remaining behind the scenes. They also eliminated many of the influential puppets they had been using to eliminate possible whistleblowers in the future, as well as their political threats, including Harry Dexter White, who helped found the World Bank, and famed mathematician Alan Turing. White they saw as a traitor, since he was giving information to the communists, while Turing was working on robotics, and the Templars did not want robots replacing their human workers. Abstergo were also involved in the development and founding of NASA, and orchestrated the assassination of US President John F. Kennedy, just to name a few crazy events they were involved in throughout the latter half of the 20th century. It was very important for Abstergo to control economics and not allow other corporations and governments to precede them in progress or technological influence without their involvement. This saw Abstergo acquire and found many side businesses and companies all linked secretly under the Abstergo umbrella. During all of these events in the latter half of the 20th century, the assassins had been busy with their involvement in the world wars and political manipulation against the Templars. All the while, the Templars were pushing further than even the Assassins could have predicted. The Templars had been working on a device for almost the entire century that could read the genetic memories of the ancestors inside the human genome, a device that we know as the Animus. The Animus's purpose was to be used to study the first civilization, find pieces of Eden, and unlock the secrets of history. Though, in the future, it became just so much more. The first recorded use of the Animus was in 1980, when the head of the Animus project and Abstergo scientist Dr. Warren Vidic ran the first tests on an unknown male known as Subject 1. The Animus had many side effects during its early development, and was not perfected for safe use, i.e. without major side effects, until after 2012. During the early stages of Animus testing in 1983, Abstergo abducted a young orphan for genetic testing called Subject 4, whose real name is Daniel Cross, who, Daniel is a major figure in the story of the Templars' rise during this time. Cross was the great-grandson of Nikolai Orlov, a Russian assassin during the early 1900s. In fact, he was the assassin who destroyed the Peace of Eden that caused the Tunguska event in Russia in 1908. Daniel was made to relive the life of his great-grandfather, and as a consequence to the early Animus tech, experienced the bleeding effect, where even outside the Animus he had the skills and hallucinations of his ancestors' memories. Before being thrown out onto the streets as a young boy, 
Vidic implanted in the mind of Cross using the Apple of Eden, an impulse to kill the mentor of the assassin should he ever come upon him. So, Daniel Cross grew up on the street, pretty much, struggling with the hallucinations of his ancestor. Eventually, one of the hallucination-driven tirades he was on in public caught the attention of the assassins, who thought he must be one of them. He ended up joining the assassins, and after several years working alongside them, Daniel was still seeking answers and what his purpose was, and why he had these visions of the past. He sought to see the assassin's mentor, and eventually got that chance in the year 2000. He was brought to the assassin mentor's facility in Dubai. The mentor was intrigued by Cross's story and ability to serve the assassin order, so he gave him a ceremonial hidden blade. However, the impulse planted in Daniel's mind came up, and very suddenly, Daniel Cross killed the mentor of the assassins with the hidden blade he was just given. Filled with regret, he escaped back to the only place he saw as a safe haven for him, Abstergo Industries. Now, over the past hundred years, the Templar influence politically and economically had never been higher. They had successfully developed technologies that was being used by people and governments all over the world and made Abstergo more or less untouchable. They had remained behind the scenes of history through their company Abstergo and were on the cusp of achieving their great plan. However, the assassins still remained at large in the world, but that was about to change. With the assassination of Assassin Mentor by Daniel Cross, the Templars were ready to make their next move in their plan, an event that became known as the Great Purge. Over the previous two years, Daniel Cross had visited a massive number of assassin camps all across the globe. So, with this information, Abstergo and the Templars launched an operation to eradicate all of the assassin camps that Cross had come into contact with. This event ultimately led to the near extinction of the assassins altogether. However, there were still some remaining camps that Cross had not seen and therefore allowed some remaining assassins to survive and reorganise into smaller cells to remain hidden. After the Great Purge of the Assassins, Abstergo and the Templars resumed their work on developing the Animus and finding more pieces of Eden. Abstergo released the Animus console in late 2012, with edited genetic memories they have recorded and released as virtual reality video games. This way, they could mass manipulate the public with propaganda that they sold as factual and historical recreations under the corporate umbrella known as Abstergo Entertainment. All the while, Abstergo planned other forms of mass populist control through Pieces of Eden like the Isu once did with the humans. This led to the development of the Phoenix Project, where a branch of Abstergo was secretly developing a way to sequence the triple helix genome of sages in order to recreate the Isu physically in the hopes of better understanding the creation of Isu technology to further use in the future. This way, Abstergo's mission of hunting down pieces of Eden through history would become a primitive one. Why search through history for them when they could just make them? The Templar Order had risen to a height that had not been seen in human history from the early 20th century up until today. They manipulated the economic system of capitalism and spread it throughout the world through a post-World War II rebuild that was funded by Abstergo Industries, the corporate and financial front of the Templars. They eliminated all opposition as they rose to prominence and developed technologies necessary to eliminate their previous ways of operating and allow the Templars to refocus on multiple ways at once for achieving their ultimate goals, all the while remaining behind the scenes. Oh, and can't forget more or less eliminating the entire Assassin Order, of which you can pretty much piece these events all the way back to some ugly creepy looking dude stealing a star from a Russian king. Thanks Rasputin.